Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the St. Ignatius College Prep uh, Preparatory School Virtual College Fair hosted via StriveScan. We're happy to have you with us. A few housekeeping announcements before we get started. This is a webinar. You can use the Q&A button on your screen to type your questions to our presenters at any time. We do ask that you um, indicate which institution you are asking the question to. It helps our presenters get to those quickly and answer your questions. Your camera and microphone are off so the panelists cannot see or hear you. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be available within about a week at strivescan.com backslash Ignatius. We have a great lineup for you today, so let's get started with our first presentation from Providence College. Hi everyone, I am so excited to join you all this evening. Um, my name is Megan O'Rourke. I'm the Associate Dean and Coordinator for Midwest Recruitment at Providence College. So let's talk about PC. And before I get started officially, I do wanna say I am based here. So that very long title essentially means that I live and work in the Chicagoland area. I actually live in Oak Park and work with students all throughout the state of Illinois. So I'm thrilled to be working with you as you go through your college search. Now, Providence College is a little bit farther away, just like my, my friends joining me in the presentation this evening. We are a small to mid-sized Catholic um, private Dominican institution located in, in Providence, Rhode Island, about five to 10 minutes away from the downtown area. So from Chicago, the flight is about two hours. Southwest flies direct as do a number of other airlines. So you can get directly into Providence um, and the airport's like 10 or 15 minutes away. So let's talk about the campus. We were founded in 1917. We are the only school that was founded by and currently still run by Dominican Friars. And um, it's a little bit like a Jesuit institution in that Dominicans are another version of Jesuits. Um, they actually have some similarities, but the kind of tenet of a Dominican education is this idea that faith and reason can coexist together and they should coexist and complement one another as you go through your time as a student at PC. Our enrollment puts us kind of right at the, the smaller end of medium size. We've got about 4,100 undergrads and just under 5,000 total students on campus. So there are a few graduate programs at PC. One of the things that I'm most proud of and I think our staff is most proud of is that retention rate that you can see at the bottom of the screen. 91% of our freshmen return as sophomores. And that's been pretty consistent over the past few years. And I think that's just indicative of the kind of experience that you're going to have. Now, we are technically designated a liberal arts school, so you can see on the screen the kinds of opportunities academically that are available to you. School of Arts and Sciences, Business and Professional Studies. Quick aside, Professional Studies um, at PC means something different than it does at other places. It's where our education, health policy and management, and social work programs are housed. We really want you to find a program that makes sense for you, that you're excited and passionate about. So combining a double major, a major and a minor, a major and two minors, whatever makes sense for you as you kind of go through your time on campus is how we wanna support you academically. We have great options for students to kind of combine a lot of things, or if you really want to create your own major. There's a great track for undecided students. We call it undeclared. So know that that is an option if you haven't yet decided on something that you'd like to study. We know though that education isn't only happening in the classroom. With about an average of 20 students, you're definitely gonna be engaged with your professors and the, the other students in the class. But we want you to take advantage of research opportunities. We have plenty of students pursuing research, whether with a faculty member or on their own. The big program that we offer takes place over the summer. So you live and work, you get a stipend, which is really cool. And it's not just st uh, science students pursuing that. I think a lot of students assume that, but really, education majors, theater majors, students that are like, I have this question and I wanna be able to figure out an answer. That's really the, the pool of students that pop into that number. If you're not doing research, you're probably doing some kind of career relevant experience or career appropriate experience. So student teaching, an internship, what have you. Pretty much all of our students are doing something like that to round out the time that they're spending in the classroom. And then last but not least, we always like pointing this out um, because so many of our students study abroad, at this point it's over 60 and I should say study away. We do have some domestic programs where you can live and learn in a city that's not Providence. So if that's of interest to you, we've got a handful of those. Your financial aid travels with you um, wherever you decide to go. There's over 300 programs in 40 different countries. So lots of cool choices. And again, 
the engagement, the education, it's all kind of happening all throughout your time, right? Your internship is connected to the research, connected to the classroom experience, maybe you're in the honors program. All of these pieces play a part in your development as a student, which is really what we're hoping um, to provide you as a, an experience at Providence College. Now, let me talk briefly about the city because I think the city is definitely a selling point for a lot of students. I mentioned the flight is about two hours. We are, for those not familiar, about an hour from Boston, about three hours away from New York City. So great location if you're looking to go East Coast and go a little bit farther away. The city of Proven Providence though is, is very manageable. It's a little more affordable than those two other cities I just mentioned, and it's very historic. So if I have any history buffs in the group, this is right up your alley. Um, you can see on the screen, that is um, the Providence River. It goes through downtown. That's the downtown area. We would love to have you to campus. June is really where we're aiming for bringing juniors to campus. And Providence is beautiful in the summer. So let me know if you're going to come because we'd love to have you on campus. Um, lastly, quick note, 120 student organizations, Division I athletics, club sports, intramurals. Students really appreciate the balance. Stuff happening in the city, stuff happening on campus. You've got the best of both worlds. Now, quickly, just to touch on this, we're going to talk about this again if you end up applying to PC, but we are test optional. We've been test optional for a long time. So we utilize a holistic review, kind of an overused term in admissions. But what it means is essay, activities, letters of rec, academic record, they all play a part in how we decide um, and how we review an application. So keep that in mind as you're going through um, your processes that we do look at all the pieces. Last but not least, this is the thing I'd leave you with. This past year, 90, or in 2019, I guess I should say, 96% of our graduates were employed or in grad school, and 93% of them were doing something in a field that they wanted to be in. So that speaks to the experience, and that is all I have to say about Providence tonight. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Emerson College. Hello, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Jasmine Williams and I'm one of the admission counselors from Emerson College. So just to start with some quick facts, we're located in Boston, Massachusetts. We were founded in 1880, not by Ralph Waldo Emerson, but by Charles Wesley Emerson. We always like to clear that up right at the start. We have just under 4,000 undergraduate students and under 800 graduate students, a student to faculty ratio of 13 to one. And we have students from all 50 states and then 63 countries and then five residence halls. And we have a three year guarantee and requirement for housing. And we're right in downtown Boston. So it's a really great opportunity to live there and be very immersed in the city. In terms of our majors, we are also considered a liberal arts school, but we say that we have a very strong focus on communication and the arts. So we say that all of our students, our storytellers are changing just in some sort of way. The only difference is the medium they choose. So you'll see a lot of familiar majors like public relations, journalism, performing arts, but then you'll see also a lot of interesting ones like business of creative enterprise. So somebody who's into the creative aspects of the world, but wanna be on the more business side or the comedic arts program, which we're super proud of. And one of our more popular majors, visual media arts, which is around two thirds of our overall student body, but then also has just a lot of concentrations you can pick from, but we'll never assign you to a concentration or we'll never restrict you to just one. You can take classes in any of the above and we encourage you to because it just makes you more marketable when you enter the field. And then I would have to mention our global, our global programs in which we've partnered with schools around the world, including Sydney, Australia, Switzerland, and France. So in which students spend the majority of their time there studying, getting a global aspect to their ed Emerson education. Then they spend some time with us over the summers and during their last years, but it's a really great integration between the two programs. So we are a very, very immersive campus. We have over 100 organizations on campus. We say as long as it doesn't involve a pool or a horse, we can accommodate it. So we always say you should do one for your major. So if you're into film, we have our student television channels and you should do one for fun. Like we have a very active Quidditch team that does really well apparently, <laughs> or we have a lot of student theater, acapella, dance, stuff like that as well. You can see all of our organizations at mconnect.emerson.edu. You do not need to be an Emerson student to use that website. So I really recommend you go check it out. Some of our activities are extracurricular, meaning you do get a credit. We are a division three athletic school and cumulative, cumulatively, our students do around 900 internships a year. And one of them is on our LA campus, which brings me to study abroad and Domestically, we have Emerson Los Angeles, which is a program for our seniors in which they go to Los Angeles. And the highlight of that program is 
an eight to 12 credit internship, which works a lot like a full-time job. So it's really cool because in their senior year, our students have these really great opportunities to intern at places like Sony or Disney or MSNBC, if that's something they're interested in. And then after graduation, there are actually a lot of them are offered full-time employment. So they're already in LA and then they just decide to stay. Or we have the Cast Castiel in the Netherlands. We call it the castle because the campus is literally a castle. It has a moat, it has peacocks walking around. It's pretty cool. Um, you spend a semester there, you take classes Monday through Thursday, and then over the weekend, you're encouraged to travel because from the castle, you can get to Germany, you can get to Italy, you can get to Spain, you can get to a lot of places, it's really cool. Those are both semester long programs. If you're looking to more just take a shorter, a shorter abroad experience, which is usually just the equivalent of one class, we have our global pathways that are literally all over the world. This is just to name a few. These are one class, usually two to three weeks during over the summer or during your winter intercession. In terms of applying, we are also a school that views our applications very holistically. You can use the Common App or the Emerson application, no preferential treatment given to either. The only difference is the Common App personal essay. Your typical required credentials that your guidance counselors can help you with, nothing out of the ordinary there. And we are also a test optional school. All of our students are considered for merit scholarship once they apply with no additional essay needed, aside from the honors program, which there is an additional essay required there is a bit of a change in the rigor of the courses while you are here, but it comes with a half tuition scholarship at the time of applying. And then in terms of financial aid, we would need the FAFSA and the CSS profile. And then stay in contact with us. We really enjoy helping students through this process. We are opening for in-person tours May 11. So I believe signups are, if they're not open now, they'll be open by the end of the week. My email is on the screen. Feel free to visit our website and follow us on social media. And there's my fee waiver code if you do decide to apply. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Emerson. Next up, Dickinson College. Good evening, everybody. My name is Amy Hall. I am the admissions officer for Dickinson College. I'm so excited to see you all tonight. Dickinson is a small liberal arts college in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, here's a good kind of indicator on a map where we are in case you're not familiar with Carlisle. We're about an hour and a half from Washington, DC, about two hours from Philly, about three and a half from, from New York City. So um, while we're a little bit more of a smaller suburban campus, we are near major metropolitan areas. Um, now, Dickinson is a small liberal arts institution, like I said, about 2,400 students. We have an eight to one student faculty ratio and an average class size of 14, but we're an old historic college. We were founded in 1783 by Dr. Benjamin Rush. We're the 16th oldest school in the country. We were founded to be a resource for this new nation, for this new democracy. Um, and that's the core of our educational model. Um, Benjamin Rush wanted Dickinson to provide a forward leaning education, one that would actually serve students in the real world. And that has become what we do at Dickinson. We are always looking to the future and saying, what do students actually need to know? What do you need to be educated in? Um, and that answer changes over time. The things that Benjamin Rush was worried about in the 18th century are not what we worry about now. What we worry about now are kind of two major issues. This first is that idea of a very global education. At Dickinson, you're educated with this whole kind of worldview in mind. Um, that happens on campus in Carlisle with this idea of um, global in, in Carlisle. So uh, you see it in a couple of different ways. You see it in the way that our majors are structured. A number of our majors have an international theme to them. So for instance, our business majors, international business and management, international studies is huge. We offer 13 different foreign languages. Um, but you also see it in the actual physical makeup of our student body. Um, almost 20% of our students are international students. We want a variety of different perspectives in the classroom. We want you to learn from people all, all over the world. And then I think most importantly in Carlisle, we teach two thirds of our classes with a built-in global component. It. And that means that you should never walk out of a class, one of those classes and say, why did I need to know this? You walk out of those with an understanding as to why what you're doing has implications in the world around you. Um, the other side of a global education is, of course, study abroad. Um, between 65 and 70% of our students um, will study abroad at some point in their Dickinson career. We do it, do it a little differently. We run our own programs. So we run 18 different programs in 15 different countries. Um, those are not farmed out to an external company. Those are not partnered with another school. Um, we run those at a, an internationally based institution. A Dickinson professor is there, financial aid and scholarships transfer back and forth, as do your classes. Um, we also have 35 partner programs. We don't like our programs and we'll work with you one-on-one -on -one to make sure you can study abroad where you wanna go and where it makes sense for you academically. Um, we're very committed to this idea of a global education, both on campus and off. 
The second kind of big topic that we've decided we needed to address in order to educate future leaders of this, this wonderful nation is sustainability. Um, that is both environmental and social sustainability. Basically at Dickinson, it boils down to, do you want the world to look like it looks like right now in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? Most people answer is to that is no, we don't. It, there needs to be some change. Um, and so we have both a green campus and a green curriculum, as you can see from the slide. Um, we are ranked number one in the country for sustainability. We are deeply committed to this. Our campus is very green. Um, we are carbon neutral. We have a college farm about six miles from campus that we um, actively farm the food grown there, served in the dining hall. So you're eating farm to table at Dickinson, um, at least to some extent, I like to joke. Um, but it's also part of our curriculum. Every single student at Dickinson has to take a course in sustainability to grow graduate. Um, we recognize that this is a topic that your generation is going to have to be fluent in. And so we have an obligation to educate you in that. Now, this is where that kind of broader definition of sustainability comes into play, because you can take classes, not just environmental sustainability, but also on topics of social sustainability, civic engagement, social justice, structural inequality. We want you to be exploring this from a variety of different angles. Over 100 different classes last year met this requirement. You do have options, but you are going to have to discuss it. But bringing it all together is applying this education to the real world. Our Center for Advising Internships and Lifelong Career Development helps serve our students, helps prepare them to launch them into careers that they're interested in. They work with you from actually the summer before you step on campus to as long as you want after you graduate. It's yours for life. Um, making sure that we steer our students and our young alums into career, um, career paths that are meaningful to them. And it's worked really well. 98% of our students are either employed, doing um, meaningful service work or in graduate school within a uh, year of graduation. When I say meaningful service work, I mean uh, Peace Corps, Teach for America, things that kind of go out and kind of further that mission of the school. We're a top 10 Fulbright producer um, and we have um, a top placement in terms of producing students for the Peace Corps. Now, this is all great, but how do you apply to Dickinson? We are a common application school. Us and about 500 other colleges out there. Um, we are test blind. We have been test blind or test optional for the past uh, 20 some odd years. This last year we went test blind given the situation globally. Um, but we've gotten really good at evalu evaluating applicants without test scores. We do meet 100% of demonstrated financial need. So that means that um, whatever your family could afford to pay and the cost of Dickinson, we have the, the onus is on us to make up the difference. We also offer a wide merit or a wide uh, range of merit scholarships. Every single student who applies to Dickinson is considered for that. So if you're interested, um, please have that in the back of your mind. Our largest merit scholarship do, does have two additional essays, um, but the rest of them are automatic review. But most importantly, we're an institution that wants to get to know you. We want to know who you are. We want to know why you see yourself as a good fit at Dickinson. Um, so please keep in touch with us. Please Please reach out, do an interview, talk to your regional counselor, um, get to know us and let us get to know you. And with that, I'm going to put the inquiry card link in the chat and I hope um, to hear from you all in, this, in the near future. Thanks. Thank you so much. Next up, Earlham College. Hi everyone. Let me just uh, put my info in the chat. All right, and I apologize if my screen starts flickering or my camera starts flickering like I'm in a found footage film. For whatever reason, the camera has been misbehaving lately. Um, but yeah, so I'm here to talk about Earlham College. So my name is John Wolfgang. I'm the admissions counselor for Chicago and surrounding areas, so I'll be your admissions counselor. Earlham College is a small, private, liberal arts college located in Richmond, Indiana. When we say small, we mean small. We floated about 800 students. Despite that, we have really great representation amongst our student body. So 25% of our students are domestic students of color. Another 23% of our students are international students. That international student population is anywhere from number one to top five in the nation amongst all liberal arts colleges in any given year. So that might be something you'd expect to find kind of on the coast or in a major metropolitan area. Nope, right here in Richmond, Indiana. So Richmond, Indiana is about four hours drive from Chicago. So it's a close enough drive on a weekend. You can head back and it's long enough that if you're like, oh, sorry, mom, can't make it back this weekend. You know how long the drive is. You can totally get away with that too. So it's kind of the perfect fit for Chicago students. We were founded in 1847 by Quakers. Don't have to be a Quaker to come here. Only about 10% of our students and faculty are Quakers, but we found it's given us a really kind of distinctive community. Um, it's really uh, gone hand in hand with the academics. Quakerism is just so singular in that regard that I think it's uh, really essential to kind of talk about how those two interplay. So as far as our majors and minors, again, we're a liberal arts college, just like uh, every other school here. So we, are, we have a variety of offerings for our students. Some of the really popular ones are gonna be things like biochemistry, neuroscience, anything related to kind of that pre-med track 
Our med school placement rate is over the double the national average. The president of the National Pre-Med Advisors Association is an Earlham professor. So again, there's a lot of really great connections in that regard. Some of the other uh, programs that a lot of our students are really interested in are gonna be things like environmental sustainability, peace and global studies, things that are very important and very kind of civic minded. Um, again, goes in hand with that, hand in hand with that Quaker mindset of just giving back, doing good, for the community. We have equestrian management that doesn't matter to everyone, but the people it does matter to, it really matters to. So I always like to point that out. And then our Japanese studies and our Japanese language and linguistic studies. Um, so we have an established relationship with Waseda University in Japan. So we offer not only study abroad with them, but we have a double degree program, which means you study there for three semesters and you end up with two bachelor's degrees. So that's really useful for students interested in kind of uh, getting a more global perspective upon graduation. The classroom experience, I think, differentiates us even more than the academic offerings. The average class size at Earlham is 13 students and the student to faculty ratio is nine to one. That really allows for those wonderful connections. And because we're an entirely undergraduate institution, you're getting uh, those lab sections and those seminars, those are being led by your professors. That's a really fantastic resource to have because that means that when you're taught in lecture, the same way you're kind of learning practically, you can integrate that knowledge in a way that's just not possible when you have two different people working in two different mindsets. So it really is important to kind of focus on that. And as you can see here, professors are called by their first names. That's another really key part of the Quaker mindset is we don't use titles anywhere on campus because we believe in equality amongst all people. And so that allows for these really great connections with professors. I mean, not up above and beyond the nine to one uh, student to faculty ratio is the fact that you're forming a kind of one to one interpersonal relationship with these people who are going to be let it, writing your letters of recommendation, who are going to be thinking of really great research and internship opportunities for you. As far as internships and research opportunities, we have something called the Earlham Advantage. So that's a guaranteed funded internship or research opportunity for every student during their time here on campus. It's up to $5,000 and students actually have to take advantage of it during their time at Earlham because we think it's so important to getting that education. But it's not as simple as just saying, okay, here's the money, go figure out something to do with it, right? If you don't know what you're interested in, you don't know what that looks like, money's not gonna do you any good. So that's why we have career coaches available, someone you can talk with, someone you can really get that kind of planned out with. As far as study abroad, because again, that's really important with kind of getting that holistic education as well. Um, we guarantee a semester or year-long study abroad program to every student that's entirely included within their tuition to those, for those semesters. Not every student takes advantage of it. About 70% of our students do do a semester or year-long study away program, but it is great to be able to offer that as an entirely affordable option to any student who says, no, this is an important part of my personal education. As far as student life goes, we have a lot of clubs and organizations. It's really easy to start a club, um, really easy to get faculty involved with the clubs as well. So some of the things that are really popular are going to be, you know, a lot of our rec league sports are really big, you know, faculty members and staff get involved with those. Um, that kind of goes right in with our athletics. We're D3 athletics, but about 40 to 50% of our students are varsity athletes. And so that's really fantastic because it means that they're a total part of the campus community, right? There's no schism between, oh, here's the student athletes and they're treated differently from the non-student athletes. No, it's a really healthy culture surrounding athletics, which I think is fantastic to be able to offer. Um, and then as far as res life, guaranteed four-year residential college. You don't have to worry about being kicked off your senior year to try and make room for a freshman or anything like that. We have singles, doubles, suite style, quad style, apartment style, theme and friendship housing. All of those cost the exact same. You aren't paying any extra to kind of live how you want. As far as the application process goes, like most of the schools here, we're Common App or Earlham College application. Common App probably just makes more sense because you can use it for so many different schools. Um, test optional, test optional during the pandemic, test optional outside the pandemic. As far as scholarships, we have merit-based scholarships. All students are automatically considered when they apply. And then we also have need-based aid. In an endow endowment per student ratio, we're one of the richest schools in the nation. We're richer than two Ivy League institutions. And so that means we can offer some really wonderful financial aid packages to any student who is interested in applying and you just fill out the FAFSA, so there's no additional supplement. As far as my contact info, you can see it on the screen. It's also in the chat. Feel free to get in touch with anything you need or if you just kind of have a more general admissions question, you can email us after all. But uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thanks. Thank you so much. Next up, Wesleyan University. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for attending this program today. 
Sorry, just realized I was on mute. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Taylor Brown. I'm one of the admission deans here at Wesleyan University. Uh, I'm just going to put my contact information in here and uh, get started. So I don't have a PowerPoint, so that should give you a nice, uh, nice eye break for you. Uh, but to give you some of the basics, um, Wesleyan University is a smallish medium, around 3,000 students, 3,000 undergrad, 200 grad students, uh, liberal arts university uh, located in Middletown, Connecticut. So we're about two hours away from Boston and two hours away from New York City. Uh, Connecticut is basically like a, a rectangle, and so we're smack dab in the center of that. Uh, and like many of my peers here today, um, you know, we, we espouse the, the values that you'll often see at a, at a small liberal arts institution. Uh, but there are a few points that I would say make us really unique uh, that you'll want to take away from this evening. Um, number one is that we are, we are extraordinarily interdisciplinary in the way that we approach our education here. So what I mean by that is that the students here are outside the box kinds of thinkers. You'll see a lot of students here who are double majoring in physics and music or biology and theater uh, and everything in between. Uh, and, and we encourage that exploration of thought by having what we call our open curriculum. Uh, and so some colleges uh, have what they refer to as core requirements or distribution requirements or general education, basically a list of classes that all students have to take regardless of what they are studying. We don't have that here at Wesleyan. Uh, so the only requirements to graduate are one, that you take a total of 32 classes, uh, so that's four per semester, and then two, that you take all the courses that are in your major. And so what that means is that you really get to be in the driver's seat of your, of your college experience from day one. Uh, and that experience is going to look different for everybody. You know, some students will come in diving, they know exactly what they want to do, and they'll dive right in freshman year. Other students want to try to take a sampling of courses in completely different departments as they try to figure out their interests. Um, and of course, you'll have an academic advisor to help you navigate those waters since that freedom is usually very new for our students. Uh, but so I, I think the students find it very empowering. Uh, and, and also you're never going to be in a class where students are there only because they have to be there. And I think that just does that does so much in terms of promoting a culture in which there's a lot of class participation, in which there's a lot of enthusiasm, um, and just a lot of academic and, 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 and really intellectual energy. Um, students are all about that exploration, and even, even the president of Wesleyan, uh, when he was a student here in the 70s, he, was, uh, he did a self-design major, and that, back then that was quite unusual. Uh, now it's not, uh, but it's something that he has always really encouraged, and then students just trying things that, that they haven't tried before. Um, and, and after all, our job as a liberal arts institution is to make sure that, you, that your education lasts you throughout your career and you'll be retiring in 2070. We have no idea what the job market's going to look like by then, uh, but what, what we deeply believe in is that the ideas of transferable skill sets, the idea of being able to draw connections between different subjects, uh, these are skills that are going to allow you to be adaptable in the job market. So that's really the, the first and most important point is that that interdisciplinary um, uh, philosophy and also the open curriculum as a vehicle in which we accomplish that. So that's number one. Uh, number two is that we're very unique amongst other liberal arts colleges in that on one hand, culturally speaking, we're very much a small liberal arts college in that everyone lives on campus for all four years. We have 250 plus clubs and organizations. The classes tend to be really small. The average class size is 20 to one is our uh, student faculty ratio. So we have all of the, all of those uh, attributes you'll often see with a small liberal arts college, but at the same time we do have status as a university, and so with that comes our slightly bigger size. Like I said, we're three thousand. Um, the fact that we do have a few grad students, so around two hundred or so. Um, but most importantly, I would say that university status brings with it a great deal of research funding. And so we have a lot of students who are deeply engaged in research, and that's true in both the natural sciences as well as the humanities and the social sciences, but I do want to make a special point uh, about the sciences uh, for two reasons. One, we, uh, we have more funding from the National Science Foundation than any other small liberal arts college in the country, uh, and two, that uh, if for students who are interested, all of our graduate programs here are actually in the sciences, and you can get a master's degree by doing a fifth year at Wesleyan, and that fifth year is tuition free, uh, which is just a really amazing opportunity because a, you know, it's tuition free, but B, the fact that you're able to do it in one year instead of the usual two is because you're really able to get deeply involved in that, in that research. Your graduate level research 
as an undergrad. And so close to half of our science students end up publishing uh, in journals before they graduate. And so students will often come to Wesleyan because of that research strength, but also having that small liberal arts environment where we don't have a graduate student dominated um, population. So you're able to really get the best of both worlds. So that's number two. Uh, number three is that we have a pretty extraordinary performing arts community here. Um, just as some students come to us for the sciences, they will really come to us for the performing arts as well, um, particularly theater and film. Uh, I'm basically re required by law to mention that Lynn Mo Miranda, the creator of uh, Hamilton the Musical, is a Wesleyan alum. Uh, and a very proud one. Uh, his first award-winning show, In the Heights, was actually first performed right here on campus as part of his uh, part of his extracurricular uh, organization, actually. Um, but we have, uh, you know, among our alums, we have the creator of How I Met Your Mother, the creator of Will and Grace, uh, the creator of Mad Men. Lots of folks within that industry. And the last point I want to make uh, is that we we have a very uh, we have a culture in which students are very politically and civically engaged. Um, and globally engaged. So 60% of our students are studying abroad. Um, students are involved not just on campus, but also in Middletown as well. Um, you know, there are over 30 different community uh, service organizations through our Center for Community Partnerships. Uh, and the mayor of Middletown is actually a 2014 uh, Wesleyan alum himself. Uh, so those are the main points about Wesleyan. And the last thing I'll just close on is just admission to financial aid. Uh, we do have to move on to the oh, next okay. and final, but if you want to put some information in the chat, that would be great. Uh, and next sure. up, we have Ohio Wesleyan University. Great. Thanks, everybody. I will, uh, I will uh, share my screen here. I hope that um, everybody got a chance to go outside and enjoy this amazing Chicago weather. Uh, I am based here in the Chicago metro area. Uh, but I work for a great university in central Ohio. So Ohio Wesleyan University, or as you see on there, OWU, uh, much easier to say than Ohio Wesleyan University five times fast. Uh, I think we're the only OWU out there. So uh, you'll hear faculty, staff, students, alums, and me just refer to ourselves as OWU. You're looking at the east uh, end of campus there, kind of an aerial drone shot there, looking across at the academic side of the campus. If you were to turn that drone 180, you'd be looking back across the Jaywalk, uh, which is our grand uh, central thoroughfare uh, that leads from one side of campus to the other. If you could get the image of a bow tie or like a barbell, that's kind of the shape of campus. We're, um, uh, we're easily walkable, bikeable. Uh, everything is within, a, I would say, a 10 minute walk on campus. And you're about five minutes from all of your creature comforts uh, nearby campus, uh, just off campus. So our signature program is called the OWU Connection. Think big, go global, get real. Uh, somewhat self-explanatory, but uh, the way that I would sum that up is a one-stop shop for internships, research, job shadowing, study abroad, domestic study, uh, any external uh, um, educational experience, we want that to dovetail together. We don't want that siloed across campus. We don't want students to feel like they have to fit that in somehow, that it's just organic, that it is just part uh, of the college experience. So, you know, you'll think big, guided, personalized research projects, interdisciplinary study. Um, that, that top picture there is actually Craig Jackson and Amy Downing. They're professors in different departments who team teach this class uh, which uh, uses mathematical modeling to help uh, better care for marine ecosystems. So taking, you know, taking a, a hard science or, or a, a math, a STEM area, and applying it to a real world uh, concept. Go global. You know, we tell students, pack your passport. As things begin, uh, continue uh, opening up, uh, we're excited for that to happen even more and more. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, certainly we were sending students all over the globe. But even during this time, we have been able to have students do some external experiences. Over two thirds of our students do travel. Um, an example of that is the bottom. That's, uh, that's Tom Dolan. He's uh, getting real, robust, practical experiences. He did our Wesleyan and Washington program. Uh, political science, as you'll see, is one of our uh, more popular majors. And it's uh, because we're just about 20 minutes from the state capital in Ohio. Uh, our DC program allows students to spend an entire semester uh, at the nation's capital. And the reason we like to use Tom as a great example, he just graduated a couple of years ago 
And he spent the time since graduation working right there on Capitol Hill. So I can only imagine what an amazing experience that's been in the last couple of years. And you've heard a little bit about liberal arts uh, focus this evening. One of the things I like about the way that education uh, works at Ohio Wesleyan is that it, it doesn't have to be a straight shot, a linear path. Uh, you can see Eva Blockstein here came to us from Maryland. Um, you know, she was interested in a lot of things, art, zoology, uh, environmental studies. And she went all over the globe, Costa Rica, Panama. Uh, her first job actually landed her in Fairbanks, Alaska. So if you are interested in uh, getting outside of uh, you know, your comfort zone, uh, there's an opportunity to do that. She even got to travel uh, with, if you didn't see in that last uh, slide, uh, our island biology class, which spent the last two weeks of their semester in the Galapagos Islands. I mentioned we're in central Ohio. Uh, if you didn't know, once you leave uh, Chicago, the next largest Midwest city is Columbus. It's bigger than Milwaukee. It's bigger than St. Louis. Um, it's bigger than Cleveland or Cincinnati. Um, we are in North Suburban Delaware County, about 20 to 25 minutes north of downtown. From St. Ignatius, it's about five hours and five minutes. Uh, I've done that exact same drive uh, and it took me uh, just, just a little bit north of five hours door to door. It's an easy drive. Uh, it is a 45 minute flight if you'd rather go to either Midway or O'Hare um, and you can do that too. All that to say, it is far enough away from home, but close enough at the same time. Uh, and I say this again, as somebody who makes that trip from Chicago uh, to Columbus back and forth quite a bit. I mentioned one of them already, but uh, top five majors, politics and government, uh, health and human kinetics. If you're thinking about um, you know, going into uh, STEM fields, the medical profession, zoology, we're right by the Columbus Zoo. Uh, business, obviously, we're near a lot of Fortune 500 companies, um, and, uh, and psychology, a, a very versatile uh, degree. We have put uh, a lot of resources, millions of dollars, into our living on campus. Smith Hall is pictured above. That is our first year residence hall. Uh, it is essentially a brand new building uh, now wrapped in a classic historic uh, shell. So we gutted the inside. Uh, and rebuilt it uh, from the studs. And the bottom picture is our new apartment complex. Average out-of-pocket cost is only $16,000. It's because if you have at least a 3.6 GPA on a four-point scale, uh, you earn our $30,000 scholarship. There are stackable awards on top of that. I would uh, urge you to check out more on our website, which you can do by either scanning that QR code or go to uh, discover.edu. And you can even uh, hit me up on email, text, or uh, via my phone, which rings my office right here in Chicago. Thanks for joining me this evening, and go Bishops. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask that all of our presenters come back on screen. Um, we have time for a couple questions, um, and starting with, um, let me remind myself, with Providence College, um, what advice would you give someone going through the college search process? So my advice at this point, I think a lot of schools are, are probably in a weird place when it comes to who can visit and who can't. So as a junior, soon to be senior, you're probably going to be um, starting your college search virtually like we're doing tonight, but at some point, probably over the summer, it's going to transition to regular visits. Take advantage of the virtual stuff. There's a lot of information out there, but once you start to do your in-person visits and make sure that you visit at some point, um, try to get the lay of the land. You know, how do you get there? What's around the campus? Exploring all of the stuff in that community, because I think for a lot of students, they get really focused on ensuring, okay, we've got to do this visit, but looking at all of the other different components of the city and the surrounding area um, so that you can kind of figure out where you're going to be spending the next four years is always a good thing. Emerson College. Hi. So I think the best advice that we always like to give at Emerson College is that you do not live on an island. Like, feel free to like reach out to us. And I think I can speak for all of my colleagues here. We're here to help. That is literally our jobs. We want to make this process as easy for you because we know it can be stressful. We know it's a very difficult transition sometimes, but we're here to help. Nobody wants to see you fail. We just want to, we want to see you succeed in whatever way we can. So really feel free to reach out. 
Dickinson College. Um, even though we don't have a supplement anymore, we used to have one that was basically one of the generic why Dickinson. And I tell students, ask yourself that question for every single school that you're applying to. Why this college? If you can't come up with at least three good reasons that don't involve a bumper sticker or being able to advertise that you're going to this particular school, um, if you can't come up with three good reasons why you are applying to the school, reevaluate whether or not you even should apply to that school. Um, really ask yourself why you're doing this because in doing that, you're gonna think about the things that really matter to you. You're gonna come up with the reasons why um, you are looking at a particular college, why there's a program there that's a great fit for you, why this might socially be a great fit for you, but make sure that you are evaluating why are you choosing to look at this particular institution? Earlham College. Yeah, I'm gonna do something really quick and really pragmatic. Uh, make a separate email and use that for all your college stuff. That way you know exactly where it's all going. Nothing gets caught in any weird filters or anything like that. You can have your, your personal life entirely separate from your college search. It's just really efficient. <laughs> Wesleyan University. I like John's advice. I'm seconding that one. Um, I have two pieces of advice. One is just be kind to yourself in this process. I know that there's a lot of media out there talking about how, you know, this school is more selective than ever, and this school has the lowest acceptance rate that they've ever had. Uh, you know, this process can, can really drain you if you use it as a, a barometer of your self-worth, um, which is just a crazy thing to do. And I know it sounds like that should be obvious, but it's worth saying is just be kind to yourself in this process and know that it's, it's a match to be made and not a prize to be won. Um, and my second piece of advice, once you get to college is, be someone who takes initiative and be a self-advocate. Um, you know, I like to think of college as being like a buffet and high school as being like a sit-down restaurant. In high school, you know, things are basically delivered to you, whereas when you're in college, you have a whole array of different opportunities, but you have to get out of your chair to seek them out. Um, and those who are the seekers and those who are the self-advocates are those who are going to get the most out of their college experience. Ohio Wesleyan University. Have fun. This is, uh, I mean, we, we, um, we want you to be honest and, and uh, be true to yourself. Don't feel like uh, there are answers that the admission panel wants to hear. What we want to know is who you are and that can help us understand the fit, but have fun with this. Uh, it, I, I understand it can be incredibly stressful and, um, and, and I understand that there's a lot of new information and it's gonna come fast and furious. Uh, and deadlines and all those things you just heard about. But we are talking about college. We're talking about uh, some of the best uh, uh, time of your, of your life. And, uh, and it, it is probably one of the biggest decisions you've made to this point in your life. So have fun with the process. I think, I think you'll enjoy it a lot better that way. And very quickly, last question. What is your favorite event or tradition on campus, Providence College? Got two and I'll go quick, I promise. Midnight Madness, which is like a celebration and a way to, to get excited about the men's basketball season, Division One School, Big East, it's a thing. And then um, we have a black and white ball. So fri Friars, Dominicans, black and white, it's a thing, those are our colors. So it's an all school dance, which I think is so fun on a college campus. There you go. <laughs> Love it, Emerson College. So my favorite Emerson tradition, being an alumni as well, is definitely the Evies. It's the largest student to run student run award show in the nation we were live streaming it this year so you should definitely check it out and I believe it is in a week so yeah you can check it out at emerson.youtube.com but it's a completely student run all the awards go to our school the only involvement is from our alumni Kevin Bright who helps oversee it and he is the founder and executive producer of Friends so it's also a really just good way to get those um networking opportunities as well and Kevin is just a super nice guy and really also wants to see all these stu students succeed. Dickinson College. Um, so my favorite tradition is that the college has a uh, history of or a process of signing in and out of the school. So um, at the very end of orientation, you march up the front uh, the front steps of our big historic building. You sign to the school registers. You march out the side steps. At graduation, you march in the side steps. You sign out of the college and you march down the front steps. My favorite part of this is that we keep all those books and we've kept those books for the last two hundred plus years. So if you're ever feeling a little bit overwhelmed, like there's you know how am I possibly going to make it through finals week? You can always go down to the library um, at consider this mentality that everything belongs to students. You can always go down to, to the archives in the library and look at the registries of all of the um, 
people who have come before you. So you can look and you can see where James Buchanan signed into the college. And then you can see actually we expelled James Buchanan. So you can see where his name was crossed out at the school registry. And then when we reinstated him, you can see where his name is. And then you can see like where he signed out at graduation. And there's a sense of continuity, the sense that you're part of something so much bigger than just this one moment in time. Wesleyan University. So I'd say the most fun and exciting tradition that we have every year is the silent rave, which is like a giant dance party on campus all outside and everyone's listening to the same music on their headphones. And so if you were walking past the event and you didn't have the headphones on, you'd see students that are dancing to nothing. Um, but the students make a huge event out of it um, with like basically the entire campus population with food and there's just a lot going on. Um, and then a more unique sort of tradition that's unrelated. Um, we have a cannon, it's called the Douglas Cannon. It's this cannon that we used to have on campus in the 1800s and students used to steal it. And eventually it went missing. And now it's just a canon that sometimes shows up during graduation and sometimes at, at other major events. And it's, and it's overseen by, uh, by a, a canon society of these alumni. It's just really interesting, kind of like Wesleyan folklore, if you will. So Amazing. <laughs> Ohio Wesleyan University. Day on the J. I mentioned the Jaywalk, that uh, central thoroughfare right through the heart of campus. And twice a year, spring and fall, we turn it into a huge festival. You know, rides, uh, a, a concert stage, uh, lots of things going on. Um, and we were, we were, it was somewhat um, uh, subdued maybe this year with COVID, but we were still able to do it. And we're excited to bring it back in its full uh, glory uh, this fall. A lot of fun. Well, I want to say a big thank you to our presenters. This is a busy week with the May 1 deadline coming up. So best of luck to you all. Thank you all for tuning in. And when you close this window, there will be a very quick, uh, or there'll be a link to a very quick four question survey. We'd appreciate any feedback you can provide. In about a week, you'll be able to find this session's recording as well as all of the other recordings at strivescan.com backslash Ignatius. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.